morning and welcome to our services today. If you're visiting with us, please take a moment and fill out one of the blue cards that you'll find in the back of the pew in front of you. Just leave that in the seat as you leave this morning. We'd also like to welcome those that are listening to us on the radio. I invite you to be with us in person anytime you can. Leading us in worship today, Greg Wilhite is leading the sync. Gary Selby will be leading the first prayer. Reading the scripture this morning is Darren Norris. If you'd like to, turn to Philippians chapter 1. The scripture reading this morning is Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Dwight Fuqua will be bringing the lesson. Heading the table is Pat Wilhite and our closing prayer by Chaz Shannon. Let's continue on our worship. 456. 456. No tears in heaven. No tears in heaven. Five hundred fifty seven. The Lord has been mindful of me.
Well, let's bow while we go Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this day, the opportunity that has given us to come out to worship Thee. We pray that the things that are said and done today will be in accordance to Thy will. Heavenly Father, we know that Thou is a forgiving God, and as we go through life, we would ask that Thou would forgive us for the things that we may neglect to do, neglect to do as Christians, and give us a stronger life to live from this, from that day on. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our help, and we'd ask that I would keep those in mind that are unable to be here, operations, sickness, in the hospital, ask that I would have the healing hand to come down and care for them as the needs that they may have. Heavenly Father, we'd also ask that I would be with this church, the members, the leadership, Give them the guidance that they need to further instruct this church in the guidance that we may live and be a light in this community. We're also thankful for the freedoms that we have. And we'd ask on this day, day, holidays coming, to be with those that are away from their families, to comfort them as only thou can. And Heavenly Father, we're also thankful for the many blessings of life that thou gives us that we may not take these for granted that there's people in this world that do not have the things that we do. Heavenly Father, as we going through this hour of study, be with us, open our minds to take in the things that are said and done, live them in our daily lives. These blessings we only ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Leave mark your books at number 316, Jesus I Come. 316 will be the song of invitation following the lesson. The song before the lesson will be on the screen, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Please stand for this morning's scripture reading. <clears throat> scripture reading comes from Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Philippians chapter 1, 21 through 24. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Good morning. It's wonderful to see each one of you here today. As is always the case, we have visitors with us, and we are just honored that you have come to be with us on this day. I'm glad to have many of my family here today. We about have that few filled at capacity, but uh, some have already come and already gone. We had our family get together yesterday. It was a great day. Nobody killed each other. It was just a good day all the way around. My day did not get off to a good start yesterday, however, because Jason's little girl, Grace, who is four years old, yesterday morning when she got up, she came and she stood in front of me and she looked up at me with those big eyes and she said, why are you so old? <laughs> and I said, because I haven't died yet. <laughs> and that's how my day got started. I want to ask you a couple of questions as we begin this morning. Are you committed to Christ? And is Christ the Lord of your life? You know, our plea as a people is to restore New Testament Christianity. And folks, that is a wonderful plea. We ought to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. There is a great need for us to return to the old paths, Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. To do that, we must plant the same seed sow and plant the same seed in our hearts as they did in their hearts in the first century. And that seed is the Word of God, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. We celebrate the fact that we have been able as a people to be successful in restoring a number of things. We have restored the plan of salvation. We have restored wearing a scriptural name, worshiping as God has authorized, the organization of the church, and that list goes on. But I want to suggest this morning that restoration is not a completed process, that there are things that yet need to be restored. And I want to talk about something that needs to be restored this morning. I want to suggest to us that there is a vitamin C deficiency in the church today. And that C stands for commitment. Our lives are to be committed to Christ. Think about it. What is the Christian life? It's a surrendered life. Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 26, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's also a new life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. We live by a new standard. Not by what people think. Not by what others tell and want us to do. Not even by what we want to do. But we walk in the master's steps. 
1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. And 1 John chapter 2 verse 6 says, If we say that we abide in him, then we ourselves ought also to walk just as he walked. See, we have a different goal. And that goal is not popularity. That goal is not material success. It's not stuff. Our goal, as our brother read to us a moment ago in Philippians 1 and 21, is to live for Christ. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I want you to imagine with me this morning that we had a time machine sitting here at the front of the auditorium. And you and I are going to get into that time machine and we're going to set the dial and we're going to go back to the first century. About 33 A.D. or soon thereafter. And you and I are going to get in that time machine this morning and we're going to go back to the first century with the intent of looking at Christians in the first century. Now, you and I arrive there, and we begin to look at Christians in the first century. What did they do? What did they do? Folks, even the enemies of Christians acknowledge that they turned the world upside down, Acts 17 and verse 6. And they did by preaching the gospel to every creature under heaven, Colossians 1 and verse 23. And as we study their lives, what characterized their lives? Devotion, enthusiasm, excitement, zeal, commitment. They live super abundant lives. You see, that's what the Master promised in John chapter 10, and verse 10. He said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That word abundantly means beyond abundant, super abounding. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to begin reading in verse 6. I want us to appreciate the fact that their faith was genuine and their joy inexpressible. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That in the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it was tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. I want you to notice in verse 7 how early in that reading he talks about the genuineness of their faith. And he ends it by talking about their joy being inexpressible. And so the question I would pose is, as we're now back in the first century and we're observing their lives, what is it, what did they have? Well, it's not what they had. It's what they did. They made Christ the Lord of their lives. You know, there's great emphasis in that in Scripture. To the very first Jewish audience in Acts 2 and verse 36, when Peter came to the conclusion of that great sermon on Pentecost, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then to the first Jewish audience in Acts chapter 10 and verse 36, to Cornelius, his family and friends, Peter said, 
He is Lord of all. A lot of emphasis in Scripture on the Lordship of Christ. And when we say that Jesus is Lord, that word in the original kurios means that he is the master, the king, the sovereign, the head, the controller of our lives. There we are back in the first century. Travel there via our time machine and we're looking at those folks' lives. And we're seeing how they forsook all to follow him. And that's what the master requires. In Luke 14, 33, So likewise, whoever you does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. And so what's the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is that we must make Christ the Lord of our lives. And by the way, this took them out of the sinning business. They were dead to sin. The fifth chapter of Romans ends by talking about the fact that where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. As if to anticipate what some might take and run with that to mean, Paul said in chapter 6, verse 1, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How can we who are dead to sin continue any longer therein? They didn't play patty cake with the world. They were married to Christ, Romans 7, 4, and there was no illicit fare going on with the world. We read in James chapter 4 and verse 4, that friendship with the world, that's enmity with God. And we would be impressed if we were there looking at their lives that they didn't go back because they didn't look back. In Luke 9 and 62, the master said that whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. They didn't look back because, they didn't go back because they didn't look back. Oh, how impressed we would be with their lives. But now, having gone back there and looked at their lives, let's get in our time machine and let's crank up that dial and, and let's come back to December the 18th, 2016. And having seen those Christians, what they were like in the first century, it's time for us to take inventory. I hope you have one of the sheets of paper that were passed out earlier because I want you to look at those three sections and, and I want to ask you the question, which section are you in? <laughs> and I know you're thinking, preacher, it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, it will when I explain it. So I'm going to explain it to you. Here's what those symbols have reference to. First of all, everybody see that big orange ball? That circle represents your life. The whole of your life. And that chair, that's not an H, that's a chair, represents the control seat of your life. Who's in control of your life? And so... The circle represents the whole of your life and the chair represents the control seat of your life. The S represents self. And the cross obviously represents Christ. Now that's what these things represent. Now, let's review. Did you get it? What does the circle represent? The whole of your life. And what does the chair represent? The control of your life, right? The control seat of your life. And if there's an S over that chair, what's that mean? That means self's in control. But what we desire is what? Christ's controlled life. And so we're going to use these figures 
to talk about, to ascertain whether or not we are living Christ-controlled lives. Now let's look at those three sections. Are you in the first section? Here is your life. Who is sitting in the control seat? You are. Self is. You are in control of your life. Where is Christ? Christ isn't even in your life. Not in any real, in any meaningful sense. And so where does that leave you? If this is your situation, you're separated from God. Separated by your sin. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, or his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. If this is where you are, then you are in spiritual darkness. You have never been delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed into the kingdom of God's Son, Colossians 1, 13, 14. Listen to Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3. You are dead in trespasses and sin. You are walking according to the course of this world. You are fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. You are a child of wrath. That's Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. Well, let me give you some other characteristics of this particular life. You are unhappy. Your life is empty. You have no meaningful prayer life. You don't study the Word of God. You are selfish, at least when it comes to God. You have withheld your life from Him. You are materialistic, you are disobedient, you are discouraged, and you are worried, worried about eternity. That's your life. You are in control. Christ is not a real and meaningful part of your life. You are keeping your life from God. Your life is aimless and spiritually fruitless. You are lost. Your life is without Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. For at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That's the first section. Is that where you are? Well, let's look at the second section. Here is your life. Where is Christ? Well, notice that you have Christ in your life in some small way. But who's sitting in the control seat? You are. You may profess to be a Christian, and maybe you are a Christian, but you are still in control and not Christ. You're not sure of your salvation where you will spend eternity. As a matter of fact, you really prefer not to think about your salvation and eternity because you're afraid to. Let me give you some other characteristics of this second section. You are unhappy. Your life lacks real meaning. If you have a prayer life, it is a poor one. You have very poor Bible study habits. You are selfish, still withholding your life from God. You are materialistic, you're disobedient, you're discouraged, and you are worried about eternity. You see, if you're in this section, 
You call yourself a Christian, and maybe you are a Christian, but you are in control. Christ is not the Lord of your life. You don't want to go to hell, but you doubt that you will go to heaven. And your life, it bears little fruit, if any, spiritually. You are controlling your life. Christ is a crutch, some spiritual fire insurance. Is this where you are? Now, I, I want to talk about the third section because this is where I want us to be. Okay? Here is your life, the whole of your life. And where is Christ? Christ is not only in your life, but Christ is your life. He controls your life. He is on the throne. You are living a Christ-controlled life. You love Him you are obeying Him. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You, in this section, have the assurance of His presence and His pardon. You walk with the King. The Lord is your shepherd. You have the peace of God that surpasses understanding. And it guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verse 7. Let me give you some other characteristics of this one. You are happy. You rejoice in the Lord always. Philippians 4 and verse 4. Your life is meaningful. For to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. In Galatians 2 and 20, I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I that live, but Christ lives with me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Your life has real meaning. You pray often. You pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. And you study the Word because you hunger for the Word. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. You are unselfish. That is, you have given your life to God. You seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. You are spiritual. You have your mind set on things above, you seek those things which are above. Christ is your life, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. You live for Christ. Philippians 1 and verse 21. And you are optimistic. If God is for me, who can be against me? Romans 8, verse 31. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 1. Or Philippians 4 and verse 13. And you don't live in worry and doubt. You live one day at a time, Matthew 6, 34. And you turn things over to the Lord. You cast all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. What we're talking about is the fact that you are living a Christ-controlled life. You're out of the sinning business and you're in the serving the Lord business and your life bears fruit and you have blessed assurance because Jesus is yours. Is that where you are? And so the question this morning is who is in control of your life. Really think about it. Are you in control of your life or is Christ in control of your life? Which of these sections are you in? Have you obeyed the Lord's commands to become a Christian? Have you repented and 
been baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. Listen closely. Are you converted? There's a big difference between having conviction, mind, and being converted, heart and life. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you are converted and become as little children, you by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Is Christ the Lord of your life? In Acts 10, 36, Peter said, He is Lord of all. Folks, He will be Lord of all, or He will not be Lord at all. In Luke 6 and 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? What does the Lord want you to do today? He wants you to do whatever you need to do to make Him the Lord of your life. And so the question is, what will you do? Are you living a you-controlled life? Are you living a Christ-controlled life? That's our lesson. The response is yours. Won't you come? Oh, my God.